Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy, and I am your host. Today, we have Trevor Oldham with us. Trevor is the founder and CEO of Podcasting You, the leading podcast booking agency for real estate investors. Podcasting You has worked with investors from all real estate product types to help them raise capital, generate more exposure, and increase their networking opportunities. Today, we will learn more about Podcasting You and also learn how guests can optimize their interviews, provide value for listeners, and quantify how being a guest will improve your overall business. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. Excited to be here and excited to provide some value for your audience. Yes, I'm excited too. This is terrific. So let's you know get into it. Um, share with our listeners how, like, what how, you know, kind of how you know, a little bit about your background and how you ended up with a podcasting booking agency. Yeah, most certainly. And I think the story goes back to 2015. And to give you some context, I was running a different company, not not podcasting you, that I now run. But that company, I had actually started my own podcast back in that 2015. I was interviewing tons of people, interviewing investors such as David Osborne. Uh, Jay Papazan, co-author of The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, and have been doing that for about two years. And that company just wasn't turning a profit. You know, it was, it was honestly a motivational-based company, and it grew super fast. 600,000 social media followers, courses, ebooks, but just wasn't turning a profit every month, just given how much it costs to run the company. Uh, with that said, decided to leave that company behind after about those two years of grinding and just started freelancing my skills that I had learned, especially in the podcasting space. And that meant editing people's podcasts, doing their show notes. And one day I came across a turnkey real estate investor based out of Los Angeles. And she wanted to get, go out there and get booked on podcasts to promote her turnkey investment company. And I thought to myself, well, I've booked some of these really cool guests on my show. How hard could that be to book her on shows? Started working with her, you know, started booking her on podcasts. She started to see the benefit of it. I realized I enjoyed it. And really since then was, was off and running, you know, five years coming up on six years soon. And, and it's funny, we actually still work with her to this day and actively work with her to, to get booked on podcasts. You know, it's, it's a little trickier now. I think we've got her on like over a hundred shows. So there's few and far between, but you know, it's, it's been a long journey, but you know, good journey at that. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. And it might be like time permitting, we can get into like the economics a little bit of your podcasting business that you had before and kind of what you learned from that. Uh, but uh, we can, you know, time permitting, we can get into that. So, all right. So share with our listeners, like what your business podcasting, you, Y-O-U does, like it's, it's overall business model. Yeah. So basically our business model is we take folks in the real estate investment industry. And I say industry because 90% of our clients are investors. The other 10% are going to be CPAs, attorneys, tax professionals, those folks that are they may not own any investment properties themselves, but they're, you know, they're in the real estate investment space. Like I saw on your website, um, I preferred partners. It was like Trailbridge Law Group. So we work with Gene Trailbridge as a client where I don't know if he personally invests in real estate, but we work with him as I know he's a big syndication attorney. So what that said is we would take a client and we basically go out there and put them out there on podcasts. We basically do all that back end like work of securing their interviews for them. But more often than not, we try to guide like the client on like, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to get more clients, you know, like such as someone like Gene, or are they someone that is trying to get more past investors to invest in their syndication deal? And we typically, you know, we'll work with our client on that and don't want to go, I'm sure we can go in depth in it. And later in this interview, I don't want to take up too much time talking no, about it now, but, but typically what we do and, you know, we'll really look at someone and say, Hey, okay, they are someone like Gene that is real estate professional and they want more clients we're going to put him on real estate podcasts, you know, real estate centric podcasts. That's his niche audience. Say, hey, you know, here's Peter. He's raising money for his syndication. Who's to go after? Doctors, lawyers, dentists, medical sales professionals, especially if they have a 506C deal. We know it's going to be a little bit harder where if it's someone 506B, you know, maybe you could go after the entrepreneurial group 
And typically that 506 C deal, you know, you're going to have to go after, you know, those doctors, lawyers, dentists, you know, those folks that are going to be making at least 200, 300,000 a year. And then two, if they are 506 B, then at that point, we got to train them on how to tell their story to make sure that they don't get into any trouble um, with the SEC. And, and it should be said, I'm not a lawyer, don't know anything about being a lawyer. So don't take my advice um, for it. But we do try to tell our clients like, hey, you can't promote your next deal on these podcasts. You can only promote your previous deals and, and what you've done just to make sure you don't run into anything like that. But typically, if they're a seasoned investor, they know about that. And they, they're very leery of trying to, you know, pushing the envelope too far, just because, you know, who knows when the SEC might come calling. All right. So thank you. So Gene, you know, he could be dropped in front of anything and be able to speak kind of, you know, gracefully and, and thoughtfully. Your your other guests that you're working with to place, do you help them like, you know, refine their story, come up with a one sheet, give them some guidance so that they can be, you know, most effective? Yeah, most certainly. And we actually give them a basically a client form. You know, sometimes I think it's a little over the top, but we ask them about 20 questions, but that helps us really develop their one sheet really goes into who they are as a person, what they're looking to achieve. Cause sometimes a client on a call might tell us one thing and they're actually mean another thing. So we have them, you know, mark that all down, build out a one sheet for them. And then from there, when it comes out to building their story, when they're going on podcasts, typically we like to say it's like an A to B type of story. And what I mean by that is just, how did you get into real estate investing where you work in a W2 job? You know, what was it that got you interested in real estate investing? Because, you know, probably the majority of folks in the space, they weren't born a real estate investor. They, you know, discovered it. Maybe they listened to bigger pockets. Maybe they checked out, you know, passive income through multifamily real estate. That got them interested in the business. And how did they go from, you know, zero units and maybe they have 50 units or maybe they went from zero units and now they're a passive investor and say, you know, 1500 units. You know, what is that story? How did you go from A? To be, and that's what we tell all of our clients is people want to hear your stories. They want to learn how you started from nothing. And then as the interview progresses, you go over, you know, what made you become successful and where you are today. And then maybe in the middle of your story, you go over the challenges you faced, you know, deals that didn't go right, you know, learnings that you have, and then what made you a stronger investor. Right. And do you, so the, the model of, um, you know, there's the, the, the guest who's the protagonist and uh, in the story and you know they, something's rubbing them wrong about their current life and or, or whatnot there's like a conflict or a challenge um could be a personal one it could be like you know how do i push my business from 50 units to 250 units whatever and then there's the uh so the challenge how that's overcome and kind of where they are now and, and probably their vision for like the future what about guests and this might be related to a question i've got coming here um what about guests that haven't overcome the challenge? <laughs> they're they're right. They they haven't climbed the mountain, a mountain which is a challenge, um, or at least they don't believe they have. Like, do you need to have something that you've overcome to be a good podcast guest? I guess is my question. I would say not necessarily. I mean, sometimes it's good if you don't have to overcome anything. And, and what I mean by overcome, like let's say you have a, a tenant that trashes the unit, right? You have a tenant that doesn't pay rent. You know those sort of horror stories. You know, I heard of a story recently where. An investor is a three or four hundred apartment complex, and they didn't do their due diligence, and all the units were rented out. To, I wouldn't say rented out. There's right. homeless people living in it in the, on the pro forma, um, and then the operating statement said that those are people counted in units. You know, things like that, where you know maybe you don't necessarily want to live through that. So there's right. definitely those folks where they could go on podcasts where people just want to hear that story of you know how did you get started into real estate investing, even if you haven't faced any of those challenges, and even if you are someone that say a little bit newer and, and say it's someone that has, you know, under 10 units and you're thinking of going out there on podcasts and what value can you provide to these shows? Well, there's someone out there listening that, you know, wants to get started into real estate investing. And it's sometimes hard for them to listen to someone that has 200 units, 500 units, because they might think, well, I don't even have one unit under my belt. You know, that's going to be inconceivable for me to get to 500 units. So sometimes it's nice where they can go and get to, you know, three or four units. Like I know for myself where I want to passively invest in real estate. So I got connected through a networking group and I've been talking to this guy and he's invested in four syndication deals in the last year and a half. So for me, that makes me feel comfortable in talking to that guy because he's just one or two steps ahead of where I want to be. Where if I'm in a group and someone's invested in 20 syndication deals and I, you know, I do the math, you know, 20 times say 50K, you know, you're looking at a million dollars. That's like, whoa, that's that's too much. But then when I look at someone that says, hey, I've done 50 
in this dealer, you know, 100K total, you know, for me, that seems more easier to bite off than someone that's invested a million dollars into these deals. And it can be the same for someone going out there on podcasts. Even if you are a beginner, there are still sort of podcasts out there for you. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think you just shared a bunch of, of golden nuggets. And I'd encourage listeners to like rewind a minute or so and, and listen to that again, because, um, you know, my view is, is that, you know, generally, not always, everybody has a story that will relate to somebody else who is um, in a similar or not too different kind of place than them, whether it's somebody with 10, you know, a company with 10,000 units or an individual investor who, um, you know, they rent an apartment and that's that. They want they want to go from, you know, their next their next place, so their next uh, milestone. All right, so this this is the question that relates to what we've been talking a little bit about but you know who is an ideal podcast guest and and feel free to answer any way you want and not necessarily oh they've done two units they've done this they've done that maybe it's a state of mind maybe it's a whatever you know the sky's the limit in how you choose to respond i typically say the best podcast guest is going to be someone that just opens the door to value and just shares everything that they know without, you know, sort of that fear. Like for me, when I go on podcasts, I'll gladly tell you everything you need to know about how to book yourself on podcasts, the exact strategies we use. Because I know at the end of the day, there's going to be some people that want to do it themselves. And then there's going to be people that don't want to do it themselves. And that's why, you know, companies like mine exist out there. So just providing as much value as you can, you know, and it goes back to whether, again, whether you have five units or whether you have a hundred units, you know, as long as you're providing value, that's really what the audience wants to see. And it can be said, you know, you could get someone that has, you know, 500 units and they sound great, but they're being overly promotional. They're really pushing, you know, their next investment fund or their next deal. You know, that's not really what the audience is there for. You know, there's a time and place in every interview for you to, you know, you promote yourself typically at the end of the show. So why do that? And it's not enjoyable for the host either. If you're coming on there and it's talking about how great you are, you know, a lot of the times the audience is going to be able to see through that. And that's not necessarily why you're on the podcast you're really there to provide value to the host's audience that's why they're having you this is why it's their podcast if you want to you know brag about yourself and all your accomplishments you know go out there and start your own podcast is what i would say to them (laughs) that's great all right so then like and i think you again you're like segueing into each question but so the person who's not an ideal fit for a podcast are there other attributes beyond um, that person, you know, wanting to promote whatever their business is, their raise is in, in uh, kind of in a, uh, at the cost of creating value. Are there other aspects to be thinking about? I would say someone, let's say if someone's not, you know, let's just say not a perfect guest, for an example, it would probably be someone where, you know, they don't have a microphone per se, or they're not in a quiet background or setting. And I can tell you back when I was hosting my own show, there'd be interviews where, I'd be talking to someone and they'd be in their car driving, you know, talking through their iPhone. That's just not going to make for a good quality interview. The sound quality is not going to be great. You know, the host is going to be able to tell that you are, you know, not paying attention to the interview and what's going on, where the same could be said as a good guest, get a nice, quiet setting, get a good podcast mic. And if you want a good podcast mic, I recommend you go on Amazon. I use the Blue Yeti mic. I believe it's about $100. You can get the Blue Snowball. I've used that as well, more cost efficient. I believe it's about $30, $40. So it doesn't have to be super expensive to get a good quality podcast microphone as well. Um, Yeah, that's great. I mean, it really does make a difference. I mean, I personally have had challenges like uh, figuring out my mic. That's not because of the mic, it's because of me. (laughs) But um, I'm I'm making some improvements uh, there. All right. So then, you know, on on the kind of like what not to do, who's not a good fit, what are, th- what are a couple of things that, you know, if you're on a podcast, you know, you should not do? Yeah, I would say one, and I've seen this before, take a phone call and take a phone call during the podcast. I've oh actually gosh. had that happen to me, not that often, but occasionally when I'm going on the podcast as a guest, as, as a, typically what I do nowadays, and I'll have a host, you know, they'll take a phone call. You know, it's happened to me one interview, like two or three times, the host had to step out of it. And it just like disrupts the flow to it. Um, I would say not be very conversational. You know, podcasts aren't sort of made to be short form answers. Like if someone says, you know, how did you start a company and say, oh, I just had this idea and I started it. Or, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got started in real estate. I wanted to make more money. You know, things like that where it's just 
that's really not that conversational. You know, you obviously you don't want to be talking five or 10 minutes straight. You know, typically about a minute to two minutes is what I find is perfect for most folks. And that gives a nice back and flow between like between the guests and then also the host as well. Cause you don't want to just be talking for so long where you know people start to tune you out where you're gonna to want to have that nice, you know, back and forth flow with the host. Yeah, that's good. You know, the flip side of that, and this is something I've had to work on a little bit is, is, you know, someone will be speaking, like you'll be talking and I'll get excited about what you're talking and I interject. And, and, and what I've had to learn is, is, you know, Peter, don't worry, take a note. You can come back to it. But in terms of the ultimate production, like interrupt, like interrupting is like, you know, it just, it messes up with the flow and momentum and it doesn't actually sound good <laughs> either. Um, but, you know, I will interject. Sometimes people, are, you know, the, the guest is very excited about what they're talking about. And, you know, the ideas, you can almost see it. The ideas are coming to them as they continue to talk. And then they talk a little long and I'll interject uh, there. But that's a little bit different. Are there things that I, I mean, and I I, I think we're, we're circling on some of these themes, but it's OK. I think it's OK to like kind of bring them up. But, it, you know, I'm a guest. I'm going to be a guest on a podcast. Are there like two or three things that I should be like thinking about with respect to the my, uh, you know, me being a guest? Like how, do, like, how does a, a guest prepare without being overly scripted to be a guest on a podcast? Like, you know, so that it's kind of ideal, an ideal preparation process. Yeah, I think first you'd want to go out and check out the podcast interviews. Um, I always recommend doing that. I know for myself, I was checking out a couple of your interviews earlier today. I know I was listening to the episode with Matt Porcaro. I believe that was the latest one. Might be a little biased. Matt's a client of ours. I always, oh. I always, I always enjoy his story but just continuing to check it out so you get a good feel for it. But honestly, it's one of those things where sometimes clients may come to us and they might be, say, very successful at what they do, but they're just a little intimidated by going out there and going on podcasts. It's something that's a little foreign to them. They've never done it before. And what I recommend for this is, is honestly the best way to go out is to overcome this is just to go out there and go on podcasts and do interviews. And what I recommend by this is there's a tool you can use called Listen Notes. And I use Listen Notes to research shows for our clients. And basically with this tool, you can search podcasts. So say you type in the word real estate investing as your keyword, it's going to show you a list of all the real estate investing podcasts. From there, you can sort by the number of episodes they have out. So you could search for a podcast that has say between 10 and 20 episodes. Typically, that's going to be a newer podcast. These are podcasts that are going to be around for say, you know, two or three months. At the most, try going out there and going on those type of podcasts and getting interviewed on those shows. One, you're going to be able to get your story down, and it's probably going to take you about five or so episodes for you to really craft your story and get it down. And then two, let's say you go on these podcasts and you are uncomfortable and you start to mess up a little bit. Typically, they're going to be smaller shows, so really not that many people are going to be listening to you where you don't want to go on a larger podcast if you don't have your story down, if you've never really been on podcasts, because you don't necessarily want to burn that bridge on a larger podcast by not having a story, by not, you know, just not being comfortable. And that's the last thing you want to do. So I always recommend for clients where, you know, if they're coming to us and they want to go on podcasts, but they've never been on podcasts before, you know, I don't want to charge them anything because they might not have a good listenership, but just try going on these smaller tier shows and just getting your story, practicing them down. And that's going to help you make you feel a lot more comfortable because again, it is uncomfortable and it is probably going to take about five or so interviews for you to get your story down and for you to feel comfortable going on other podcasts. Uh, that's, that's that's good advice. So I want to shift over to the, uh, or kind of pivot a little bit on the creating value and then quantifying the value, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of think of it in terms of value for the guest, right? So we've talked about creating value for the show and now, now creating value for the guests. And I don't know if this is slicing things too thin, but um, what, can you can you talk to how a podcast guest can uh, create value or realize value from being a guest on a show for their, let's just say, you know, their clients, investors, whomever their audience is? Yeah, I would say, you know, the value, let's say as a, let's say as a guest per se, is one, you know, for your clients or, you know, let's say potential clients, one, they get to hear you where if you go on your website, you're going to probably have this nice professional bio, say it's, you know, a couple hundred words. That, that sounds great. At the end of the day, a lot of the investor bios sound the same. And it's not to say anything that's wrong with that. But you go on there, they say, hey, you know, this is when I got started in the industry. This is how many units I have. This is how many assets I have under management. 
things like that, you know, where it sounds great, you obviously got to have those numbers there. But what if now you have like a, say, a media section on your website and you go out there and you put all the interviews that you've done. So now you get a prospective person and they say, hey, you know, Pierre's bio looks great. His deals look great. But I just want to learn just a little bit more about him. Now they're going to go over to that media section. Maybe they do listen to, you know, a 25, 30 minute interview with you. And you've been on a few podcasts. They start to listen to you. They see you talk more than so, more so than just seeing your bio on your website. And they're able to build that relationship a little better with you. So that's one advantage. And the second one I would say is definitely creating social media content from the interviews that you do is that typically on an interview you do, like let's say the interview goes 30 minutes, you could probably take and create at least five to six social media clips from that one certain interview. And that's where I always tell our clients to go out there, you know, typically primarily LinkedIn, as that seems to be the space for real estate investors more so than any other social media platform and you can go out and you can create a one to two minute clip. You know, let's say the host asks you a question like, how did you get started in real estate investing? Then you just literally take take that clip that you did, put a title, how I got started in real estate investing, learn more about my journey in the video below. You know, let me, let me know what you think in the comments. And then people get to see that one or two minute clip. So there's just so much social media content that you can take from the interviews as well. Yeah, that, that, that's. I think those are great, um, great ideas. And what's neat about being a guest is you could take that interview, as you said, create five clips, um, you know, based on whatever you know the, the clips are, and then space them out over. You know, you don't have this. You know, uh, put up to social to LinkedIn all five clips in a week. You can do it over, <laughs> yep. you know, several months, um, and and that's that's great. All right, so going a little bit more into the value uh, conversation, into a little bit more detail. How do you how does one as a guest quantify um you know the benefits of being a guest? Like is are there ways that you can truly quantify yeah, the outcomes? I would, yeah, I would say, you know, for us, it's creating landing pages um for each inter- each specific interview that I do. And I make it very specific to that show, but I also make it repeatable and scalable. And what I mean by this is I typically will take my pod my you know, our website name, podcasting you, I'll do dot com slash the podcast name. And at the end of the show, that's where I'll tell the audience to go to. And then I'll have a link to our calendar to schedule a call with our team. You know, that's that's sort of my value add is going on podcasts and trying to, you know, potentially drum up new business for our company. So I can pinpoint, you know, when someone went to that landing page on our website, I can see when they scheduled their call with our company because it's going to be at the same time. And that helps me quantify, hey, I went on this interview, it released, you know, today. And now I have, you know, four new people coming to our website, signing up from that specific landing page to schedule calls with our company. And you're able to, you know, really quantify it from there. I know a lot of our clients, they don't necessarily have, you know, set up those specific landing pages, but they might have a section on their investor portal or their investor, you know, about us page or investor questionnaire, I should say. And it says, how did you hear about us? And you put, you know, they drop down and they say podcast. And then you have another drop down that says, you know, what podcast type it into the box, you know, if it's someone that has an ebook, you know, same sort of thing, you know, if all of a sudden you get 10 people signing up for your ebook and you didn't do anything different other than a podcast interview got released that day, then you can go back and and understand that's why that happens. That's usually how you're able to quantify it um, in that sort of sense. Uh, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And especially if you, so you're doing a landing page for each podcast that you're a guest on, the landing page, I assume is pretty like similar, like it's like a template. So you're able to scale, you know, you're not reinventing the wheel, um, but each landing page gives you like has a, in your instance, as I understood, has a, um, you know, schedule a call or whatever. So you can kind of track the call to the landing page to yep. decide, you know, this podcast had a lot of results or this one didn't. That's that's great. Um, all right. So then, you know, let's, let's kind of shift again. Lots of people, are, you know, consider maybe I should start a podcast Maybe I should be a guest. Can you talk to like the decision making one might consider when evaluating those two options? Yeah, most certainly. And I think the first consideration you have to have is time and the time commitment that you have. And what I mean by this is if you're going out there and being a guest on a podcast, take this interview you know, that I'm doing today with you, Peter. I come on, say, 30, 45 minutes. At the end of the interview, I close my laptop and it's done. Where on the host side, you have to prep for the interview. In the beginning, you have to, you know, host the interview, then you have to take the interview, splice it up, put it out there, 
um, you know, through the podcast outlets like iTunes and Spotify and, and Google as well. So that's a lot of work, you know, as a host and someone that's starting their own podcast, sometimes it could take two to three hours per week per year, for your time just to do one interview. Whereas a guest, you know, it could be 30 or 45 minutes. Sometimes as a guest, you get that benefit from going out there and going on other people's podcasts already have that pre-built following where if you're starting your own podcast, it's going to be where it could be, you know, quite a while, it could be six months to a year before you start to see any results. But at the same time, if you're someone that's a little bit newer, it might be worth your while to start your own podcast and interview folks that are successful. All of a sudden people start seeing your name with folks that are, you know, well-known in the industry, you know, it might be, it might be worthwhile then, you know, I would say probably it's a pretty good mix of our clients of folks that are either a just want to guest or B just want to be a host. And then we do get that little mixture in the middle where folks that are also a host also want to be a guest. So it, it really just comes down to like, what are you looking to do as a guest? Sometimes you can't control the narrative of the interview as you're up to the discretion of the host's questions where when you host your own show, you can ask the guests, you know, typically whatever questions that you would like. So they both have their benefits. They both have their, you know, quote unquote, up and downs. Um, so I think you really got to ask, like, you know, at the end of the day, what's your time commitment? You know, if you're a client that only has three hours per month to really get their interviews done, you know, interviews done, you might be worthwhile being a guest. But if you're someone that says they have 10 extra hours per month, it might be worth being a host. So you just got to really ask yourself that question. And if you are someone, say, that is a little bit newer, you probably do want to edit it and produce the podcast on your own. If you are a little bit more successful, you could go out and hire a company to edit the podcast where you just conduct the interview and they handle the rest of that. Typically those services are like from anywhere from 300, 500, you know, a thousand dollars a month, where if it's someone that's just starting off, um, it might be a little bit more difficult, but I could say for the first two years of me running my own podcast back in 2015 to 2017, you know, I pretty much did it all on my own. I didn't have any money to go out there and hire anyone to help me out. You know, I was booking the guests, I was editing the show, I was writing the show notes. And I, I remember teaching myself, and I'm not sure if it's still available just because it's been quite a while, but Pat Flynn, um, he's a very successful entrepreneur and he hosts a podcast called Smart Passive Income. And he had a tutorial and it was literally like seven videos, maybe 20 minutes each and walk you through exactly step-by-step -step how to record your podcast, how to edit your podcast, how to get guests and, and all those likes. And it was just free. And you just watch those tutorials and the first week, it took me, you know, six or seven hours to edit the first couple of episodes. And then over time, you start to get the hang of it. Maybe you cut it down to that two or three hour mark um, per week. So it's it's definitely doable. Yeah. And right. So, I mean, your 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 you know, kind of main point that you have to think about your how much time you have mm -hmm. and money you have and et cetera. I think that that'll help uh, people decide. And then also, I mean, and, and you, were, you were getting at this, but to just emphasize each whether you're a podcast host or a podcast guest, um, you know, what they have in, in common is the word podcast. But as a host, uh, you know, you have to, be, you know, kind of be refining, working on your questions um, and and be good at, at asking questions and, and, you know, creating a flow for the podcast. And as a podcast guest, you know, the stronger you are at your story, which we've talked about, and, um, you know, and innovating within your story so that you can zig and zag a little bit. And it's not just road. I mean, that's that, that takes time and effort. And um, and and usually it takes being on shows and doing shows to get that uh, refined. So. Um, all right. So final couple questions here. Um, I'm interested in how your personal networking has been a factor in building your your business. Could, could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, no, it's it's been one of the biggest things for me to grow my business, you know, especially in real estate, it's very network oriented. And, you know, for me, the biggest thing has been doing networking groups. You know, I'm coming in as someone where, you know, I haven't, say, invested in real estate per se. I do mortgage note investing and I'm looking to invest in my first deal as an LP. And then I also have this business where, you know, for five years, we've been working with real estate investors and just doing these networking groups and talking to these real estate investors. You know, even though I'm someone that's a hasn't invested per se, you know, for me, I want to be an LP. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to be a GP. That's not something that I'm looking to do. I'd rather say, hey, here's 50 or 100K. And I find that by doing these networking groups and meeting all these different real estate investors has tremendously helped me grow my business. And then, two, when I'm in these groups, 
I'm never being overly promotional. You know, I say, hey, this is what I do. This is what my company does. And if someone wants to learn more about it, then, you know, I'll have a call with them later. But I never want to be too overly promotional because sometimes people just have no interest in being a guest or have no interest in being a host, you know, that sort of thing. So networking has definitely been key, even just going on, you know, bigger pockets forum. You know, I try to go on though on the forum a few a few days per week, just check out, see what people are saying. And again, trying to provide my input. I've actually picked up probably two or three clients in the last month or so from just going on bigger pockets. And someone might ask a question, but I don't know the answer to it. Like someone might say, hey, you know, does anyone know a good syndication attorney? And I'll say, hey, you know, I've worked with this guy, Gene Trowbridge. You know, he's a client of my business. I personally never worked him worked with him as a syndication attorney outside of my business, but I do know he does a very good job. I know his clients are very successful at what they do. I would recommend checking him out and just providing value like that, where again, not being promotional, just trying to provide that value has definitely paid you know a lot of dividends in my business again, because real estate is very, you know, not not so much transactional or just very like network sort of based where right. you know people aren't going to sign up for you or you know, similar if you talk to an investor for the first time, you know, and they don't know anything about you, are they going to fork over 50 or 100K to invest in your deal? You're probably going to have to nurture and build that relationship. Maybe talk to them a few times, you know, maybe they hear you a few times on podcasts, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think that's that's good. All right. So second question, you know, we're facing a lot of economic uncertainty, maybe a pending uh, recession. So I'm just curious if there if you've noticed any trends or changes to your business, whether it's the, your your operating business or the guests uh, that that you're representing that are coming on shows. Any any changes, differences, trends, you know, today versus say 12 months ago? Yeah, I would say I would say typically the clients that we're working with are going to be more successful now. And the reason and the reason I say that, and it's not to discredit the folks that are a little bit newer. But there's been a, a huge jump of folks in the syndication business in the last couple of years. And I don't know if the pandemic, you know, people were home and I had more freedom, you know, to really look at it. And during the pandemic, the business was doing phenomenal. And not to say that the business still isn't doing good, but I noticed that we were taking on a lot of folks that were a little bit newer in investing, folks that have maybe have only tackled two or three deals on their own, where now the clients that we're working with are those folks that have been investing for 10 or 15 years. And they're folks that, you know, Maybe they didn't go through the 08 crash, but maybe they were starting their investment business, you know, 08, 09, and 10. And they sort of know, you know, what's going to be going on. They're the folks that have done, you know, 15, no, I wouldn't say 15, maybe 25, 30, 40, even 50 deals or more that they've quarterbacked and they've taken down. So they know, you know, what's going to happen where I find that the newer folks that we were working with, you know, probably about 25% of the time those folks are sort of sitting back on the sidelines because they just don't know what to expect just because they don't have that experience. So mm -hmm. they're still, I would say we're still talking with clients and they're still finding deals. They're just being a lot more selective. Their underwriting is being a lot more conservative than, than what they were just so in case, like the worst case scenario, like, you know, what happens if the tenants can't pay rent, you know, what happens if interest rate, interest rates continue to rise, you know, things like that, that, you know, I'm sure is on the mind of every investor. Um, but typically we find that the ones that are more seasoned, more experienced are the clients that we're getting more often uh, nowadays. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Trevor, thank you for coming on the show. If listeners would like to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. They can go to our website, uh, podcastingu.com slash P-I-T-M. On that again, uh, podcastingu.com slash P-I-T-M. All right. I'm actually taking a note. All right. Um, and for listeners who would like to get a hold of me or have interest in being on the show, uh, please feel free to send me an email at peter at Vertical Street Ventures or reach out on LinkedIn, Peter Pomeroy. And as always, please consider subscribing to the show. And if moved, please leave a five-star review so we can continue to have terrific guests like Trevor Oldham on the show to share their insight. Thank you all for listening. And I wish you a great week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to verticalstreetventures.com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, 
you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.